All right, folks, we're in a 945 square foot basement. This is my basement. Uh, this is a 100% waterproof floor. This is a three coat epoxy flooring system. Before we start, if you like what you watch, please hit the like button, please subscribe and watch the following video. I'm gonna to explain to you how we install this floor in great detail. This is a three coat epoxy flake floor system, two tone, freehand edges. I show you how we do all this. Uh, all these materials are available in our online store as well as tutorials from me. If you buy our products, I'll be more than happy to spend as much time as I have to on the phone with you so you can do the same project yourself and save a ton of money. Um, so you'll see in the video how we did this. I did just want to show the transitions, which you don't see while we do the floor, but now you can see them because the floor is done. So that's our floor. Um, the after product, we have a living room area here. This is basically for the kids to hang out and just do whatever with their friends. I, I have to admit, we really don't use the basement that much, but I did want it to at least be nice. So that's that. We have a uh, workout area here that my wife put in, and the rest is pretty much hangout area for the kids. So stay tuned for the following video. I'll show you how to do this, how to purchase the materials, and help you do the same thing. Uh, today, we're gonna be doing a flake floor in, this is my basement. Uh, so this basement had carpeting over the whole floor, and it had VCT tile off to the right here. Um, so we removed the carpet, the VCT tile, and we had tack strip all around the perimeter. So there's holes all over the place from the tack strip. So if you see down here, it's, oh God, every four inches, six inches, whatever, all the way around the perimeter. So it's a mess. So we're gonna go around the perimeter with the patch all those. And then the other thing we had is there was a tack strip, transition strip, whatever you wanna call it, between this and the other epoxy floor. So what I took a, is a four inch straight wheel and I cut a line right here. You can kind of see the groove a little bit because that brass strip was glued to the epoxy. If I would have pried it off, it would have broken the epoxy out. So I just cut a, a slice across there, popped everything out. Now we're good to go. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use our fast set crack filler, uh, which we have set up over here with two ketchup bottles. We're gonna mix this up. We're gonna patch all these holes. There's also some random cracks in here, like here's one here. There's no joints in this floor. So we're going to patch all the holes and the cracks and then we're gonna start grinding the floor. And as far as the grinding goes, a lot of people ask me what, what we use to grind in vacuum. This is a Hilti VCD50 vacuum system. This is a purge vac. Uh, it's real important that you use a purge vac when you're grinding because every like five or 10 minutes, whatever it is, this has a reverse purge and it shakes the filter and the dust falls off of the filter that's caked up inside the uh, vacuum so it keeps the filter clean. As far as the grinder itself, this is a Hilti DG150 grinder. It's a six inch grinder. This is the general purpose Hilti wheel on here uh, that we're going to use to grind this floor. Uh, my guess is this floor is going to grind fairly easy. I'm just taking a guess. It's softer just by the way it looks. We are also using the rack attack to crawl around on, well to kneel on when we grind to save our back. So uh, we'll set this, uh, we'll set the camera up, we'll start recording and you can watch us go around the perimeter and start filling these holes. Okay, so we're getting ready to fill all the uh, nail holes around the perimeter. So these are the squeeze bottles that I use. We have it marked at two ounces and four ounces. So we're only gonna do a four ounce pour each time. This material sits in about, it sets in about a minute and 30 seconds. So you don't have much time to work with it. You do not want to fill the whole ketchup bottle because you probably won't get rid of it. So I'll show the first one here that I mix up and I'm going to be on the move. Caitlin can follow me around and you can see uh, how I fill this. All right, part A, part B. This is a one gallon kit, by the way. And I don't have anything on the floor because we're going to be grinding this floor. Obviously, if you have a finished floor, put cardboard or something down first. This first pour could be a little interesting too. Not too bad. Two ounces of part B. And this is why you use cardboard. Okay, so here we go around the perimeter. These are the holes. This stuff is very thin. I'm just gonna run right around and all I'm doing is filling this and trying to slightly overfill each one. 
And I'm just going to work my way right around the perimeter here. This is all going to be ground off, so even if it's high, it doesn't matter. Now, Jared is behind me. He has another ketchup bottle. He's going to start where, where I started, and he's going to go the opposite direction so we don't run into each other here. So I'm just running right down here, letting this self-level right in these holes. Now I have a crack here. I'm going to come back and do the cracks after we do all these divots. All right. That was it. So that was four ounces. So four ounces did about, I don't know what, 25 feet of wall here. So this goes pretty far. So I'm going to mix up a batch, or we're just going to keep going until we're done. All right, so now we went around the perimeter. We filled all the nail holes. That was like literally 10 minutes. Um, so now we have the cracks in the floor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pre-fill these cracks with sand. I didn't with that one. I had some leftover material. I just wanted to use it up, so I poured it in there. Um, so I'm just going to show you what I do to pre-fill these cracks. This is a real fine sand. I don't know if you can see how fine that is, but that is very fine sand. See, it's filtering through my fingers. Uh, it's 70 mesh specifically. But what I typically do is I'll take a ketchup bottle or some kind of bottle. I'll just pour the sand on top of this, let it filter in there, work your way down the crack like this. And then I'll just take a dust brush and I'll do this kind of thing just to kind of work the sand in there. And then when the sand holds, I'll just kind of keep coming down like that. And if you don't do this, this material is so thin, just like this crack right here. Again, I, I filled that just to not waste material, but it ran right down the crack. So if you pre-fill it with sand, it's just going to help the clotting effect of this material. Now, any cracks that are too fine, I'm not going to fill that with sand. It's, it's too fine. So you only have to worry about the, the cracks where the sand will fit into. Okay, I have four ounces again in this bottle. Now I'm going to go over this crack. This is pre-filled with sand. So I'm going to go over it. It's probably going to just run right down. And then I'm going to have to come back probably two or three more times to fill this. You know, when you're filling a crack, you want to try to like keep a wet edge on it. So um, when your ketchup bottle runs out and you refill it, um, go right back to the crack that you just filled and top it off again, just to try to keep the material wet. So now I'm empty. See most of this drained down. I'm going to go refill and come back and do it again. Okay, so we probably went over these cracks four or five times until they stayed full. Uh, they were wider and the sand kept filtering down. Cracks are all done, and now Jared is going to take the first shift with the hand grinder. Um, we did realize real quickly this is very soft concrete, so we were able to move at a pretty fast rate. So here you can see a close-up. Um, you have the scratch in the surface, which is what you're always looking for you before you put any coating down. Notice how Jared's going in a circular fashion with the grinder, too. That's always very important with the hand grinder. So you can see there's no airborne dust at all um, with this setup. That's why I love that hand grinder so much. Um, this did take approximately three hours, probably four bins of dust, um, but it went really quickly. Got a good scratch over the whole surface. Okay, folks, a couple days ago, we ground this floor. We prepared it for a flake floor that we're gonna be doing um, today over the next couple days. Um, since I ground the floor, we did paint the walls first because I want to get that done before the epoxy. I'm going to flip this around. I'll show you what we have. Okay, so we painted the walls now. It's just much easier to paint before you do the epoxy. You don't have to worry about splattering paint or anything. Floor is ground. There's some drains in the floor. I taped them. Got them all ready for the, uh, the epoxy. 
trying to find an area to show a scratch here. I don't know if this can zoom in on that or not. There's a scratch in the floor. This is a pretty soft concrete. And there's even some spider cracks in here, which I'll show you what happens with that when you use the primer. But those will all fill in. We filled in all those little holes around the perimeter. Right now they're filled with epoxy. They're just a different color. And that's it. Now, I don't tape edges uh, because when you tape edges, you have to peel the tape right away. You have to retape after every coat, which is quite a pain. So I freehand all the edges. So I have my mixing station set up over here. So what I'm going to do today, we're putting down the primer. This is their low viscosity primer. We're going to put that down today. And then what we're going to do on the rest of this floor is we're going to do a two color, two tone flake floor. So we're going to do a two foot perimeter around the whole perimeter of the basement in one color and the center in a different color. Never done it before, so I'm still trying to figure out exactly how I'm going to do it, but you're going to see me do it on camera. powder on these gloves. It's not, not any epoxy. So this is a phaser tan color. This is going to be our base coat. Again, this is just the primer. What's happening now, is since we're doing multiple coats and multiple two-tone whatever around here, I want to get the primer down so we get all the dust out of here. Because uh, right now you walk across this floor, even though it's been prepped and vacuumed really good, you're still tracking dust around, which you don't want. So <clears throat> so what I try to do when I pour this out is I try to pour one bucket over half the floor. That way I know the second bucket is going to coat the second half of the floor. You always want to make sure you have enough material. As far as tools, I have a 24 inch squeegee, six inch edge roller, and a brush. I lie, I have an 18 inch roller, it's back there yet. One thing you always do before you get started, get your roller wet up in a puddle while you have a puddle. Once you squeegee it out, you don't have a puddle, it's not as easy to wet your roller up. So this primer is 93% uh, solids. There's 7% solvent in. It's still a very, very low odor material. Very user friendly. So the point of this primer, at least for, for this particular flooring system, is just to uh, get a thin coat on the surface here, this is going to penetrate into the concrete. So when we put our next coat on, our next coat is going to be bonded to this material which is soaked into the floor. Primers are extremely important and uh, they should be used on every flooring system. Um, it's the cheapest insurance you're going to have to make sure you don't have an issue later. Because the only way you're going to find out if you have an issue is if you have one later and then you're stuck dealing with it. And you don't want to go through all this work and realize it all got messed up because it didn't use a primer. That would be a horrible, horrible situation. So I go around the perimeters first, and this primer is like disappearing here. So you gotta watch whenever you go around a drain. When you're not looking, normally the epoxy will creep down to the drain, but as most drains in basements, it's the highest spot in the basement. Why? Because it can. I don't know why. There's never a drain that's at the right elevation in the basement. This one is too high. Good thing is the epoxy won't go into it. 
bad thing is it really doesn't help me with water. But I don't have water in here anyway. And this is a walkout basement, so I, we're, this can never flood. I mean, yes, water could roll across the, the floor here, but it's going to go right out the other side of the basement. Pushing some of this puddle back. So I definitely got the yield I was looking for, and then some. Three gallon batch. I'm go around this edge quick. Just my six inch roller. This ever soak in down here. Okay, now we got to roll with the eighteen. out of material. I'm going to mix up my final batch. You can see where I made this out to here. I got about 600 square feet out of that. And you see there's a couple little areas here which I didn't even see those were little nail holes. And you see it kind of soaked in a little bit. That's what the primer is supposed to do. This definitely is not the pretty coat, but without this primer, anything else you put on this could debond if it's not penetrated into the surface. So that's why we always install the primer. problem is my mixing area is in the middle of the floor I'm doing. So now I got to move this out of the way. So I want to make sure I don't over pour with this. about a gallon left in this bucket. Well, that worked out pretty good. We're out of material and floor is coated. Now I just got to do the edges and get off the floor. Folks, so this is the primed floor. I don't want to walk around too much and leave little pinholes in here. That's what the primed floor looks like. So now I'm going to try tonight to do the next coat on this. We'll see what happens. Okay, it is about eight hours later. And I came down in the basement. Much to my surprise, this stuff was set up enough to walk on. So what I did is we're putting a border in here 24 inches wide. So I put little hash marks on the floor. I pulled, in this case, I'm using duct tape. So what my plan is with this is I'm going to install this epoxy with the flake tonight, overlap the tape like an inch with the epoxy and the flake. And then tomorrow morning, probably 5 a.m. when I get up, I'm going to pull this tape and it should snap a real nice line, or at least that's the plan. Blue tape, I think, would tear. 
So I have everything laid out here. I just got to trim these edges because I have some overruns with the tape. Like right there, I just need to square that up. Square that up. Um, we're doing the phaser tan intermediate coat. And the flake color I'm using for the perimeter is going to be the Twine 956. Uh, there it is in the bucket there. And then the inside is going to be a different color. It's going to be a bluish color, which I'll show you that when we do it. So I'm going to set this up on the tripod. You can watch me get set up here and get at it. So we're going to start mixing right here. And then I'm going to work my way clockwise. Well, I'm going to try clockwise. We'll see what happens. That's my intention. We'll see. So the way I have this calculated, maybe, is that this gallon and a half should do the whole perimeter. It's going to be real close. So I want to try to like make sure I make it. Because I think I have the whole perimeter calculated out to like 230, 240 square feet. This should theoretically cover 250 square feet. But that doesn't take into account wetting up the roller. And I'm going to have a lot of edges here. And edges, you just tend to lose material just because there's a little overflow when you squeegee up against the perimeter. So we'll see what happens here. Now what I'm doing also is I'm leaving these buckets um, open. Normally I would take these buckets and I'd throw them in a bag or something like that. I'm leaving these open. I have two other three gallon kits. If I have to break one down, I'm leaving these open so I can fill them uh, a gallon and a half gallon. That way I know I'm on ratio. So I never recommend breaking down kits just because it's so easy to go off ratio. I just realized I left my mixer in here. So I just ran around the perimeter and poured some out. I only made it halfway, so it's not looking very good. Anyway, I'm going to get right on it right here. We'll see what happens. So I do have to say going around this perimeter is very time consuming. I only have a 24 inch wide path and I have that puddle of epoxy that I don't want to overflow into the rest of the floor. So it did take quite a while to go around the perimeter, but the material was still very workable when I was done, which was about 45 minutes later. Now that I have everything squeegeed out, I just came around with my brush and I'm just pushing um, some epoxy into the areas that I can't get to with the rollers, just around the door frames, really. All right, so now I'm just doing this detail work. I'm sorry, I didn't have a camera person before, so now I have somebody to hold the camera and follow me around, and all I'm doing is the detail work with the brush. And then I'm going to use that six-inch roller and get the rest. I'm going to get this drain in the corner here. I got one door over here and I did run short so I'm going to have to mix a little bit more. I'll cross that bridge in a second as soon as I get done with this. Now what I did in the prep work I used a saw and I cut straight across there. It's only like an eighth of an inch deep but I'm freehanding this. And all I have to do is get flakes to stick here. And that transition should be pretty darn close. Now let me get the 18. I'm going to roll everything out. Start flaking. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I need to edge with the 6-inch roller here. got under there already. I stopped right here. So I'm just going to use this as my mark. 
before I stop. Now I'm going to use the 18 and I'm going to go around, get everything rolled and then flake. <coughs> Once you get the initial edge done, it's not so bad. It's getting all that detail work in the beginning. And if you have somebody that can help you, this is great. If not, you can do it on your own. The important thing is, is when you, when you pour this out, like I did, I, I mixed it up, I poured it out. Once you pour it out, this gives you at least 40 minutes of working time. So I poured it out. That gives me plenty of time to roll this out. Take care of all the detail stuff. This may have been one of the only times I did not put spike shoes on. Normally I have spike shoes on. But I actually feel comfortable reaching out. It's only 24 inches here. Lots of doors to go around here. All right, so the rest I'm gonna get with the 18. This is where I ran out here. So I ran out from this point here to there. If I have to mix up a little bit, I'm gonna mix up like a half a gallon total or something. Now I'm gonna take the 18, roll everything I couldn't get with that, and then I'm gonna flake it. chunk of something on my roller. I don't care how many times you vacuum, somehow you'll always have a chunk of something that you'll find. Okay. Now I'm going to flake everything we just did. I'm also going to take off this one glove because it's contaminated. So I had epoxy on it. Let me get another glove. Trying to put a glove on a wet hand is not easy. All right, so now I stopped right here. I can't flake to this line because when I come around and hit it, I'm going to uh, overlap and it's going to leave a ridge. So I'm going to flake like here and then work my way all the way around. flake. Now normally I throw this up in the air here. I'm just trying to be a little careful just because of where I am. I don't want to overlap what I just told you I didn't want to do. So I get around the corner, this won't be so bad, but all right, now I can throw and kind of use the wall as a backdrop. Just trying to be a little careful here. This is right where everybody's going to come downstairs. So I don't want any imperfections there if at all possible. So make sure when you throw your flakes, you throw them up in the air and let them shower down on the floor so you don't leave clumps on the floor. Of course, another thing I'm thinking of while I'm doing this is we're right on the edge of the stuff not being hard enough. So where I'm stepping on these flakes, I'm hoping these come off tomorrow. I might have to scrape this whole floor, including what I'm standing on, trying to get these flakes out of there. We'll see what happens. Cross that bridge when I get to it. I 
Now after I get this whole thing flaked out, I will probably come back again with these flakes and hit this maybe a little harder. This looks like full flake to me, but I don't want to use all my flake up and not have enough to finish the job. So I'd rather have it all done kind of medium than run out and not have enough to make it heavy enough rather than like run out and have a bare spot. That would not be good. All right, I'm going to stop at this post just because I have to mix more now. Okay, now I ran out of material. So now I need to mix up, got a half a gallon total, something to that effect. So let me get my other kit out, I'll show you how to do that. Now, I'm going to say right off the bat, I don't condone breaking down kits. It's very easy to go off ratio, and if you go off ratio, you're just going to have a complete mess on your hands. If you go off ratio and the stuff never sets, you're literally going to have a sheet of fly paper all over your floor. You can't scrape it off. You can't grind it off. It's going to stall your grinder out. It would be the worst thing you'd ever have to deal with. So do not ever go off ratio. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do here, this was a, a gallon and a half. This was a gallon and a half mix. So what I'm going to do is half of each can. So we're going to have half a gallon there, and we're going to have a quart there. So it's going to be three quarters of one gallon total. So it's half of that. lid back on this because I need that for tomorrow and then I'm going to fill half of that spot on to me. I'm going to set the lid back on that. Notice I have this lid sitting on the cardboard, so if it drips, it's on the cardboard. And I probably still have another 10 pounds of flake or so left, so I have plenty of flake. So as soon as I get done mixing this, putting this down, flaking, I'm just going to walk around again, make sure I'm flaked and over flaked to make sure everything is coated good. All right, now, I'm gonna put that inside of there. These gloves are nasty. I'm going to attempt to, well, I'll get my hands to dry eventually. Low speed. Okay. Notice how I tilt the bucket back like that so it can't drip on the floor. I'll set that back on the cardboard. And I see already I have a big puddle. I'm going to have a lot of left over here. So I'm starting to spread this out evenly. Okay, I'm done with the squeegee. So now I will set this on the cardboard as to not have epoxy run all over the floor. Now I need my small roller 
which is hiding back here. So one thing, when you're pulling trim off these walls, you want to make sure you get all the nails out of the wall. Because if you don't, I can absolutely guarantee you when you do this, you will catch every nail on the wall. You're going to splatter epoxy all over. Your roller is going to fly off. I don't know what will happen, but every time something bad will happen, I can assure you of that. So you get all the nails off the wall. I think I'm done with that brush, but I'm going to set it like that just in case I need it. Okay. Got everything rolled out. Now I got to get this roller off without leaving a mess here. So this. yourself out of a basement. There's no room to really work in here. And there's carpet. I do have plastic on this right here. But all right, now I gotta refill my flake. Flake what I just did. Go around the whole perimeter, make sure it's coated, and then we're done. I always say you want a base color that's complementary of your flake. So it's actually hard for me to tell whether this is full flaked or not, because the base color actually, there are, if you look in here, there's some darker flake that actually are very close to the phaser tan base color. So now I'm just going to kind of look closely, see if there's any spots that look light. And I'm just going to go over the whole floor, well, not the whole floor, the whole perimeter. It's like here's a light spot right here. This all looks really heavy here. Turn that one off there. And of course the light down here is not very good, so it's hard to see. I think we're good. Did I miss anything? <laughs> Camera girl's awfully quiet tonight. All right. Okay, that's it. So tomorrow I'm going to come down. The plan is I'm going to peel the tape, and hopefully the tape peels well. We'll find out. Um, I just want a nice straight edge. And then we're going to coat the inside here tomorrow with the same color epoxy with like a bluish flake. So that's it for tonight. We'll see you tomorrow. Okay, the moment of truth. crisp line. I'm just going to run around and do all of the tape removal. Okay, so this morning I showed you pulling the tape off of this. Uh, and now it's around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm still within my 30 hour window. You try to recode between 24 and 30 hours. So pulled the tape, vacuumed everything up, got everything ready here. You see how I have it laid out. I'm going to be trying to freehand these edges. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, I'm pretty good with the roller. Um, the tape, I have to say, it leaves, it can leave a, gl a glue residue. I don't want to leave the glue residue on top of the other flake that I have down. So I'm going to try to freehand this. So I'm going to mix up more, pour it down, flake it, see what happens. All right. 
going to have a headlight on for this so I can see this edge really clearly because I don't want any obstructions or shadows messing with me when I'm doing this edge. So I'm just going to pour some around here first. Now, one thing you always want to do is watch behind you when you do this, because these puddles have a mind of their own. You'll be looking one direction before you know it, you look behind you and the puddle's rolling across the floor. So, you just want to make sure nothing's moving. I like to pour a stripe about every four feet or so. Now I'm leaving like a 3 8 inch puddle or so, about a quarter inch from the edge. And the rest I'm going to pull over with the roller. And the corners are tricky. I can't step out of this because if I do, I'm going to track the epoxy on the flake over there, and that's not sealed yet. So if you see the angle in my squeegee, I'm angling it to the left. It's kind of like a snow plow. See the angle of my squeegee? As the puddle gets bigger, I change my angle to pull that, that overflow away from that line. I want some overflow, but not too much. Somebody commented in one of my last videos, they said I'm doing it wrong, I shouldn't be using spiked shoes. You should be able to reach out and do this without spiked shoes. Well, if, if you can, have at it, man. I, I don't know if I've ever met anybody in the universe that can actually do it effectively, because walking in this is so much easier than trying to walk around and stay out of it. Besides that, if you have a problem in the middle, at least you can walk out and get to it. All right, that was three gallons of material. I have about two and a half left. I'm just looking at the area. I have plenty here. And I have a little bit of a puddle here I'm going to wet up in. Remember I said you always want to wet up in a puddle. and then I'm going to walk out there and start edging and then roll the body. Now, when I edge, this is actually easier with a long roller like this. When I edge, I'm going to eyeball right down this edge and I'm going to well, it's not working the way I want. Oh, there we go. It wasn't wet up enough. It's 
nice with a, a long roller like this. And there's a puddle right there. I'm going to try to get some of that puddle out of there. With a long roller like this, your angle doesn't change as quickly. Now I have my six inch edge roll. I'm going to walk around one more time before I throw a flake just to make sure I got everything. So even if you leave an eighth of an inch gap between the epoxy that I'm putting down now and the flake, you're putting quarter inch flake on top of this and it's going to overlap, which I have a plan for that. I'm almost embarrassed to say it until I try it, but in the event we don't have a straight edge, we'll see what happens. Not bad for freehand. If you were doing this with a short roller, you'd be zigzagging all over the place. With a long roller, right now my handle's, I don't know, six or seven feet long. So for the smallest adjustment out there, I have to move an inch or two in the back. So it's very slow adjustment, so you don't get that jerky motion. This is slow and steady for sure. You don't want to do this too fast. Take your time. All right, got all the edges. Oh, no, I didn't. I got to get this here. I was a little thin over here, so I just rolled out in a puddle. Now I'm going to back roll the middle and flake. Oh, I still need the uh, that little roller. I just have to do the corners. that up in a puddle like I tell everybody to. As long as you do it back here and work your way up so it's not dry when you get up there. Now if you don't feel comfortable freehanding like this, I would highly recommend taping. question is, what tape can you use that doesn't leave residue on the floor? That's, I just found a little chunk here. I'm just going to throw this out. Well, that'll make you dizzy. All right, now I'm just going to back roll this whole floor. Well, at least up to here, I can flake that. I'll show you how we do that. Careful how fast you roll. If you roll really fast, you're going to shoot splatters up. You see, they're going to hit your wall or splatter on top of your flake floor out there. So you don't want to go too fast. As long as you walk flat-footed with spiked shoes, you don't leave marks. And one thing you never want to do is flake right up to your wet edge. So you want to stop out here with the flake. I'm just going to roll out here just a little bit so I can flake down to this 
area here and I'll mix up more do the rest of this and it's kind of tight quarters working my way out of here because all the equipment and everything is behind me plus I have the cameraman that's going to be filming me and I have to somehow work my way up the steps without knocking anything over All right, now I have some semblance of a straight line going across here. So now I'm gonna get my flake. I have them in a bucket over here. I'm gonna walk out, I'll show you how we flake this. That's crazy. This in the bucket, this does not look anywhere near this blue. Which I know you guys maybe can't appreciate that on film there, but this looks like a pretty close match. So I'm obviously over flaking what we already did, but that's dry, so it doesn't matter. I think that's going to look really good. So I would rather lightly throw flake all over than throw it too heavy and run out of flake. So I'm lightly covering everything. I'm just kind of monitoring how the surface is taking everything. I'm just trying to look for consistency. So I'm going to stop about four feet from that wet edge behind me. So I'm just going to flake everything in this area. And then once I get the rest of it coated with epoxy, I'll continue with flake. Okay, I'm out of flakes, I gotta refill. So now I refilled, I'm just walking around looking for light spots. That's why I have the headlight on too. I'm actually looking for glistening. This is a very chameleon color. I throw it, it goes from turquoise to like brown. This is very unique. But you see when those flakes hit that, that line, they stick to the wet stuff and they don't stick to the other. I'm hoping I have a nice crisp line to begin with, but I might have to dress that up, we'll see. Looks good to me. I don't want to waste flake. I'm going to continue with the floor, and then when I get the whole floor done, I'll come out. I'll probably throw some more. I'm going to get this nook down here. I'm going to say you throw these up in the air. You always want to throw them up in the air, and I actually like twist my hand when I throw them to kind of break them up. Sometimes they get a little clumped up, so. All right, I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna mix up more, finish this, and then continue flaking. Okay, I got my last batch mixed up here. So actually, I'm gonna start pouring back here. I gotta get this edge. Actually, I'm going to leave this in the bucket. Now, I always tell everybody, don't leave epoxy in the bucket. It is going to set quickly in the bucket. But if I pour out too much, I have a problem. So I just need to quickly get these edges and get a gauge for how much I do or do not need out here. Keeping that in mind that the stopwatch is going. See that little edge rolling off of there? It's exactly what you want. I'm going to change my angle as I have to to keep that edge going. Go right down to the end. I'm 
All right, now I just got to quickly squeegee this out because I have that epoxy in the bucket. This will definitely get you dizzy. All right, so that's my leftover puddle. So now I'm just going to walk this puddle out here and kind of lose it out in the floor. It's easy to do. That's it. So now I know I have enough material. I don't need to worry about that that material setting in the bucket. What I am going to do is put this lid on this bucket because when it heats up, it's going to smell. Right now, I will say the odor is probably a one out of 10. It's barely detectable. So now I just got to do the same thing I did on the other side with the edges. That was a close one. Before anybody asks, I have never fallen in epoxy in 28 years. If that would have been the first one, it probably would have been a really good uh, clickbait picture, but. And that goes for Jeff too. I mean, he and I have both had some wicked spills, well, slips over the years. Feet flying in all different directions, but never went down. Okay. I'm just going to use my hedge roller here, go around this stuff here quick. These columns, by the way, we are going to box these out. We're probably going to end up putting square boxes around them or something. I didn't get that far yet. It's kind of last on my list of things to worry about. I gotta wait this squeegee off and get this out of the way. This is always exciting while you're on a floor. So all I'm doing is getting the bulk of this stuff off for now. Alright. Now I have to lay this so I can grab it when I'm done. So I'm laying it here. That's my acetone because I need to go out that way. Alright. Gotta kick this roller off. If I can get my camera person to move a sec. Yes, I'm doing this on white carpet again. Keep going with the flake now. Everything is epoxy. Now I have plenty of flake. I have another full box. And I see right out there, there's a light spot, but I will get it. People tell me all the time when you throw the flakes, why don't you use one of those grass seeders? You would have to fill your grass seeder 50 times by the time you do this. There's no way you're going to be able to do this effectively with the grass seeder. All right, I got to refill this again. Okay, filled another bucket. I probably have two more buckets. So I'm gonna flake out here, get everything coated, then go out one last time and just throw excess. You wanna make sure if you're going around columns, you get behind it, because it's easy to miss a spot and you don't see it until the next day.
All right, I'm going to refill the last bucket, go out and touch everything up, make sure we're good, and we're done. So now I have this headlight on. I'm looking for glistening. Obviously, I'm looking for the base color through it, if you can see it. Seems like you use a lot less when you do this. You're just kind of lightly going over the whole thing. I mean, I see a couple sparkling spots, which means it might be a little thin. Just want to make sure there's nothing obvious. Okay, I think that's it. I'm being very careful to flat foot this. If I slide now, now it would be devastating. It would push the flakes out of the way and you'd have like skid marks. So I'm just taking my time, just looking for any bare spots, anything that doesn't look consistent. This is actually really hard to see if there's a bare spot simply because the one flake color is just about identical to the base color. And even if there was base color showing, you really couldn't even see it. I think it's a wrap. Okay. We'll be back, um, I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow, we're going to scrape this flake, clean the edges up good if we have to, vacuum everything really good, and then we're going to have to put a clear coat down. So thanks for tuning in, we'll see you tomorrow. Okay, so what we have done is you saw the inlaid part here, um, we poured yesterday and flaked it. Now we scraped all the flake in two different directions, we vacuumed everything really good, because I can't have any dark flake in this beige color. So the edges are cleaned really good right now. So what the plan is this, um, we're going to do the perimeter. I'm gonna pour a puddle around the perimeter. I'm gonna use my 16 inch squeegee, pull the puddle off of the beige onto the center part, all the way around the perimeter. The beige flake can land on this flake and he can't tell. This flake can't land on that flake or you will tell. So I'm gonna do the perimeter first, pull the puddle into this, then roll the perimeter, then roll the inside. That way there's no dark flake contaminating the outside perimeter. Yes, you could do this in two separate pours if you wanted to. I don't want to, I just wanna get this done at one shot. So um, as far as tools, I have my 16 inch squeegee with the EPDM blade. This EPDM blade is imperative that you use, especially with light colors. If you use a black blade, the black blade is going to melt as you drag it across the flake, and it's going to leave little black marks, especially if you let your squeegee sit like that. You're going to pick it up after 10 minutes, and you're going to have a line on the floor that you can't get out. So EPDM won't do that. I have my 18-inch roller. I have a 6-inch edge roller. I do have a brush. I have my spiked shoes. So we're going to mix this up, and we're going to get at it. Okay, here we go. This is our uh, standard top coat. It's the clear UV top coat, part A and B. This is a three gallon mix. It's two gallons of part A, one gallon of part B. Comes packaged like so. So there's two gallons in the bottom of this, and then you pour the one gallon into it. What's convenient is it comes with the buckets. So you can mix right in it, so you don't need extra buckets. Now this does look slightly yellowish. That's the uh, UV inhibitor that's in it. Now this is not designed for direct UV exposure. I mean, this is inside for intermediate um, 
UV exposure, you know, a little bit here and then. That's about it. Um, it also helps when you put it down. If it's crystal clear, you can't see it. Now I'm going to try to pour a controlled bead around the perimeter here. I'm actually going to start right here. I'm going to work my way all the way around, hopefully to there. So the whole point of this is, is to stay close to the wall because I want to pull the puddle away from the wall, across the flake, and onto the blue. As always with epoxy, once you mix it, you don't want to keep it in the bucket. You want to pour it out. This is going to give me like 45 minutes at least to play with this. Now, I'm actually not putting my spike shoes on yet. Of course, first thing I find is a black hair. Stuck in there. God only knows where that came from. Yeah, what is that? You can't make that up. Looks like a woolly mammoth was in here or something. Okay. Okay, here we go. So. Getting started is going to be the toughest part because I'm going to have to find my rhythm here. And every time you squeeze it, it seems like there's always a different type of rhythm. So I'm trying to leave a little bit of a puddle up against the wall, real tiny. I'm pulling it out so the puddle doesn't all go under the wall. I don't want to waste material. Of course, there's horrible lighting down here. I should have my headlight on. That's what I had yesterday. But Okay, I have a piece of drywall. Because it can. My father in law taught me that. One of his famous lines. And I'm just going to come straight out. thing on this wall. And I'm trying to go with a pretty heavy top coat on this because I want this nice and smooth. I don't really need any traction. This is my basement. I'm never coming in here with wet feet. And if we do, it's because there's a flood. I can tell you this is not easy on the back. Now, so I have quite a puddle. I'm going to push some of this down and around the corner here. All right, so now I'm squared up to this edge right here. Now at least I know where I stopped. 
I'm going to try to push that puddle over. I got to watch. I don't want any dark flake. I'm doing that to clean the edge of my blade off. dark flake. Of course. And I'm just trying to pull this puddle in so I'm off of the beige totally so I don't have to worry about it. Alright, now I'm going to put my spikes on and squeeze you the rest of that out. And normally I like to use my 24 inch squeegee. That is by far my tool of choice. However, trying to do those edges controlling a 24 can be a little much. I'm going very light pressure on this. I also realized I never wet my rollers up, which I can't wet them up out here now because I'm going to pick up dark flake. So, somewhere, I'll have to get a puddle. I might have to wait for the next batch. So I'm just going to squeegee this out for now. And again, once you squeegee this out, you have like 45 minutes at least to work with it. So you have plenty of time. I'm going to have to mix up more material anyway. Alright, I'm going to have to mix up more material. Alright, before I mix up this next patch, I'm just going to go around these edges quick. So, we have dogs upstairs that are making a lot of noise. Maybe Amazon showed up. <laughs> the house is on fire and we're down here rolling epoxy oblivious to what's happening upstairs. All right, so I mixed up my second batch. I have to be careful so I don't pour too much out now because I'm working my way into the middle. Alright, I forgot to wet my roller up last time, so now I'm wetting my 18 up in these puddles. And then what I'm going to have to do is squeegee this out, just like I did over there, get everything off into the color, and then back roll the perimeter. Because that's the plan. Now looking at my squeegee, I have flakes all over the end of this, so I'm going to wipe it off quick. 
So I'm going to go back into the beige. Okay, now I'm just going to squeegee all the beige out. Every time I bang the wall, the dogs think somebody is knocking. Okay. All right, now, let me just continue to squeegee this out. I still have material in the bucket, which you have to be very careful of. Okay, need more material out here, so all we have is this little area right here. Oh, I do have a puddle right here. Push this out. I don't want to pour too much out. Like the worst thing you could do right now. I have nowhere to go with it if I pour too much out. It's better to pour 10 more times than pour a big puddle and realize you have nowhere to go with it. I'm trying to watch in the light for glistening so I don't miss a spot. Granted, I'm going to back roll all this. I'm going to try to squeeze it consistently first. Okay, so all I have is like this three foot by three foot area. I have a little bit there. I'm just going to pour a little bit of a puddle right in the middle here. And that's going to be plenty. And I can distribute that around. This I got to get up. Actually, I'm going to put over here. is coated. Now I got to start back rolling so I don't have too much time to play around here again. I gotta get this stuff off. And I got the whole thing edged. The only thing I need to do is take a brush and get this door frame. Brush is gone. Okay. Now I used my edger on everything that's light. I'm going to edge everything that's dark. Because once I do that, I can't go back into the light. And then I'm going to back roll this whole thing. Okay. Now all I need to do is run the 18 and I'm good. I'm going to Knock this roller off. We'll set this right here. That'll probably be glued there in the morning. All right. Now 
sorry about the lack of camera angle here, but I'm just going to run right around the perimeter now. And what I'm basically doing is one 18 inch wide roll from the wall out. I'm going to go around the whole perimeter with that. Then the next one, I'm going to overlap both, but I'm going to do it in the center of the roller. So half of the roller is contaminated, the other half is not. And I'll go in a straight line all the way around the perimeter. At least that's the plan. There's always a plan. I have a dark flake right here. I know you can't see it from back there, but I can, and this will drive me crazy. All right, and this is where I started. All right, so now I'm going to show you here, just so you see, what I'm going to do is right in the middle of the roller, I'm going to split this roller in half. So at this point, my right half, I'm going to go right down the middle. That's one roll. Now the only contaminated half is the right half. And I'm going to go right around the perimeter. And that's going to get me nine inches into the color. So the whole reason why I'm doing the roller half and half again is because the darker flakes at this point on the right side of my roller, there's going to be some loose flakes that inevitably are going to get picked up by the roller and I will re-roll them on top of the lighter colored flake, which will obviously show on the floor. So I can't get the dark flake and the light flake. So at this point, I need to keep each color separate. That's the whole point of that. All right, that's it. Now, of course, I saw one mammoth hair again back at the other end. There. God only knows from where. I'm going to turn these light switches off as I go. All right. I overlapped nine inches already. So I'm just going to do this half out here quick. And you want to make sure you overlap a bit here because you're, you're doing clear. This is horrible lighting you really can't see. Pretty sure I got this already, but I don't have a good glare here, so I don't, don't want to miss it. Okay, that's it. It's a wrap. I'm going to be back probably two days after this cures. I'll walk around. I'll show you how it looks when we were finally done and able to walk on it. Okay, two days later, and I need to expose these drains that I had taped over. So this is what I do. This is a, what they call a five in one tool. Well, they call 15 in one. Well, whatever we call it, a five in one. Apparently, there's 10 other things you can do with it that I'm not aware of. Okay, there's one down. It's funny, there's one here. I totally covered it, you can't see it, so. It's important that you do this while the epoxy is still pliable. This is about 24 hours later, I believe, so it's still a little soft. If you wait until it's really hard, it's brittle and it tends to flake as you do it. So you want to do it on the softer side. I got 48 hours on this floor, so it's setting up that I'm walking in socks. I'd probably be fine with shoes, but I always like to be cautious. The 
That's it, we're all set. Okay, folks, I'm all done. You can see I have the furniture behind me. I'm gonna flip this camera around. I'll show you in detail what we have done now. Okay, so this is the joint with the flake there. You can see these lines turned out pretty good. I mean, it's, this was freehand. It's very difficult to get a perfect line, but very acceptable in my book. As far as texture, it's always very hard to describe texture, but you can easily slide your hand on this without cutting yourself. I mean, it's a, a nice textured floor. Um, I did use about five gallons of top coat on this. So I had plenty with two 500 square foot kits for this whole floor. There's some of the detail work. It's a little work area my wife put in there. See all these edges? It's actually turned out really nice. The reflectivity is great. It's easy to clean. And that's it. Okay, so this is a 100% waterproof basement floor. So I could flood and you would simply squeegee the water out, vacuum the water up, whatever you have to do. And you don't have to deal with the carpet and mold and mildew and all that other stuff. Of course, the walls would be a different story. Um, now I do have drains all over this floor, so I highly doubt I could ever flood here, even if I wanted to. But if you have a unique flooring situation like this, you wanna give me a call, I'm gonna put my phone number right below here right now. Uh, give me a call, I make myself very available for all customer service, whether you're looking to purchase materials, whether you have materials and have questions about installation, I'm always here for you. Call me, text me, and I can help you out. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you on the next one.